As the 21st century dawned, the Challenger II main battle tank, with its powerful L30A1 120mm rifled gun and advanced defensive armor, stood as a pinnacle of British military engineering. Proven in diverse terrains, from the Balkans to the Middle East, it had exclusively served British forces. Yet, as it entered the fray of a new theater of war in the late summer of 2023, its destiny took an unexpected turn. In Ukraine, the Challenger II, now a source of fascination and pride for Ukrainian forces, faced a critical test. Trained rigorously by the British, these new operators had quickly developed a deep respect for the tank's capabilities. As they maneuvered it through the unpredictable battlefield, they relished the power at their fingertips. But in the chaos of war, the tank struck a hidden mine and was suddenly immobilized. At this moment, it became starkly vulnerable. An enemy, seizing the opportunity, eyed this machine's newfound weakness, threatening to taint Challenger 2's impressive record. In 1998, the Challenger 2 main battle tank entered service with the United Kingdom. Developed by Vickers Defense Systems, the tank responded to the British Army's need for a successor to the Challenger 1. The new vehicle's development focused on incorporating cutting-edge technology and a robust armor system, reflecting the lessons learned from earlier tank models and Cold War-era combat experiences. One of the most outstanding features of the Challenger 2 is its exceptional level of protection. It's equipped with second-generation Dorchester armor. This advanced composite armor, combined with a specially designed turret, provides unparalleled defense against kinetic and chemical energy projectiles. But despite being one of the most protected tanks in the world, the Challenger 2 is not without vulnerabilities. Because British Army doctrine at the time asked its tankers to fight defensively while dug in, tank designers applied some of the thinnest protection to the lower front hull, known as the glacis, which would be underground when the tank fought from behind a revetment. However, in the 30 years since the Challenger 2 entered service, the British Army has added bolt-on armor to the glacis. British tanks are famous for their unparalleled long-range firepower. In 1991, a Challenger 1 fired its 120mm rifled gun from a distance of 3.2 miles and knocked out an Iraqi T-55, breaking a record for tank-on-tank -tank gunnery that still stands. With a superior L30A1 120mm rifled gun and better optics and fire control than its predecessor, the Challenger 2 should be able to fire even farther. Two 7.62mm L94A1 EX-34 chain guns supplement this firepower. The Challenger 2 first serviced the British Army in 2000, when deployed in Bosnia and Kosovo, primarily involved in peacekeeping operations. While Vickers Defense Systems had grand plans for the Challenger 2, including worldwide export, the end of the Cold War led to less developed tanks than initially thought. The last of nearly 400 created was delivered in 2002. But it was in the Iraq War when the main battle tank showed its true firepower, particularly during Operation Enduring Freedom. For their work in the desert, Challenger 2 tanks were equipped with sand filters and did not venture deep into urban areas due to a lack of urban combat equipment. Right from the start, the tank demonstrated unparalleled capability in exerting extreme pressure on the enemy, compelling them to retreat in the face of its swift advances. Deployed by the 7th Armored Brigade of the 1st Armored Division, during the siege, a total of 120 Challenger 2 tanks provided fire support to the British forces around Basra, knocking out Iraqi tanks, mainly T-54s and 55s. During one fierce urban battle, a Challenger 2 tank faced an assault from irregular forces armed with machine guns and rocket-propelled grenades. In the initial surprise attack, the tank's driver experienced impaired visibility. While trying to maneuver the tank in reverse as directed by the commander, the other optical systems also became compromised, causing the tank to lose traction and end up in a ditch. Fortunately, the crew remained unharmed inside the well-armored tank until it was recovered for repairs, with the sighting equipment taking the most significant damage. The tank was fully operational again within six hours. The Challenger 2 tanks did not suffer any losses from enemy fire. The only tank lost was due to an unfortunate incident of friendly fire. Subsequently, the tanks were assigned to less prominent non-combat roles. Following the 2020 reorganization of the Army, there are only three remaining Challenger 2 tank regiments, the Queen's Royal Hussars, the King's Royal Hussars, and the Royal Tank Regiment, 
each serving as the tank regiment of an armored infantry brigade. Additionally, a single army reserve regiment trains reservist challenger crews. However, a resurgent conflict would bring this tank to the Eastern European front lines for the very first time. When Russia invaded Ukraine in spring 2022, the latter quickly ran for aid from several nations, including the United Kingdom, a known warfare powerhouse. One of the specific requests in their aid package, in addition to self-propelled guns and armored repair and recovery vehicles, was for Challenger 2 tanks. Initially, then Prime Minister Boris Johnson declined the proposal, with British Defense Secretary Ben Wallace publicly stating that such an idea would not work. However, things changed in early January 2023, when, in light of the developing situation, the British government confirmed an initial supply of 14 Challenger 2 tanks to the beleaguered nation. A spokesperson for the new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, ratified this decision, which was a reflection of, quote, the United Kingdom's ambition to intensify support. Late that month, a group of Ukrainian troops traveled to the United Kingdom to begin training with British soldiers from the Royal Tank Regiment and the Queen's Royal Hussars. The British Army trainers spent several weeks training Ukrainian personnel from the powerhouse 82nd Air Assault Brigade, teaching them how to command, drive, and work together to fight with the tank. Even Sunak himself and Ukrainian President Zelensky visited the soldiers at their training camp, where the two ratified their collaboration and affirmed that their use of the tank marks a step up in the Ukrainian forces' capabilities and ensures that the most modern and sophisticated gunnery systems in the world allow them to protect their crews during battle. By late March, the trainees were ready. That month, the Ukrainians' first Western main battle tanks arrived in the country. In addition to other donations of Western-manufactured infantry fighting vehicles, armored personnel carriers, and self-propelled artillery, with the arrival, Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov assured, quote, these fantastic machines will soon begin their combat missions. The Ukrainian 82nd Air Assault Brigade, the sole user of the 14 tanks, is an offensive brigade. At the time of training, it was ready to attack the South, an area crucial in the conflict due to its strategic location and the presence of key cities and infrastructure. For months, this area had seen intense fighting as Ukrainian forces attempted to reclaim territories occupied by Russian troops. In mid-August, the 82nd Brigade attempted to liberate the Robotne village in the country's long-awaited southern counteroffensive. Rolling into battle north of Robotne, a critical Russian strongpoint on a 50-mile-long axis towards occupied Melitopol, the 82nd joined the fight quickly making a difference and giving the Ukrainian Southern Command the momentum needed to liberate the village a week later. But this win was also partly due to a crucial modification to these tanks. Despite the marvelous technology of their state-of-the-art tanks, in keeping with their known liking for changing technology to suit their needs, these new Ukrainian Challenger 2s also have their own twist. Despite Glacis armor updates with the British Challenger 2s, the Ukrainian tanks came without it. So, before being deployed to the field, the Ukrainian military improvised. In early September, photographs and videos were posted by the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, including a video featuring an 82nd Brigade tanker. Analysts and warfare aficionados quickly noticed a unique change. The Ukrainian army had added protection on the lower front of the 69-ton tank. This new glacis protection is clearly meant to protect one of the tank's notorious weak spots from tandem warheads, like that on the Russian Army's Comet anti-tank missile. Other photographs of the tanks also suggest a top-mounted slat armor, similar to those found on Russian vehicles used in the conflict, primarily meant to protect from UAV attacks. From the get-go, there was no doubt the Ukrainians loved their new rides. Proud of their creation and following their win in South Ukraine, the armed forces released a video of a tank soldier praising the Challenger 2 describing it as more resilient than Soviet equivalents. In a short documentary produced by the United Kingdom Defense Ministry, one air assault tanker described his new vehicle as a diamond as well as a beast. Another tanker, recorded while standing next to his four-person 69-ton Challenger 2, stated that, quote, this tank is like a sniper rifle. However, this excessive pride would dissipate barely a week later. Mere days after the Ukrainian Defense Ministry highlighted the tank's capabilities in a video interview, 
A Challenger II, shifting positions from outside Robotne to outside Verbova, struck a mine. Knowing that their immobilized tank had become an easy target, the Ukrainian crew quickly bailed out, and moments later, a powerful Russian Comet anti-tank missile struck the precious vehicle. The tank might have survived if the Comet had struck the immobile tank on its reinforced glacis. However, the missile's operators hit the vehicle in another weak spot, and the missile's tandem warhead exploded slightly above the tank's turret, where the armor was also thin and there wasn't any additive armor. As the missile found its mark, it ignited a devastating blaze that rapidly engulfed the Challenger II. Within moments, the intense heat reached the ammunition charges, stored in their specially designed containers. These chambers, usually filled with water to forestall any secondary explosions, were meant to be the tank's last line of defense in such situations. In the chaos of the strike, they could not withstand the ferocious heat that overwhelmed their protective design, leading to a catastrophic failure and a partially dislodged turret from the tank's hull. It was official. The Ukrainian armed forces had lost their first Challenger II tank, and with it, the first ever Challenger II loss by enemy fire in its 25 years of deployment. While the photograph of a lonesome burned Ukrainian Challenger II tank in Robotne may be a symbol of defeat, it also comes with a silver lining. After this loss, the Russians knew how to take down Challenger II, immobilize it, and hit it from above. According to one crewman of a T-90 tank, in a state media statement, they are trained in how to fight the Ukrainian Challenger IIs, quote, We are 100% ready. We have studied the technological characteristics of these machines, where they could be struck. But this valuable lesson cuts both ways. Now, in addition to knowing about the vulnerable glacis, the Ukrainians know about another, the turret top. The Ukrainians also clearly know where to strike a T-90 with the Challenger II's powerful gun that some have described as sniper-like. The story of the Challenger II main battle tank is still being written. Currently, the United Kingdom has 213 remaining Challenger II tanks and is in the process of developing Challenger III, which is set to gradually replace its predecessor beginning in 2027. So, to some, the initial delivery of 14 Challenger II tanks may only be the beginning of a new main battle tank friendship. This would be a very valuable addition to the Ukrainian arsenal. In the Challenger II documentary, one of the tankers stated that, quote, a few more companies for our country would be quite good if used correctly. <laughs>